The Super Bowl is back in Minnesota for the first time in 26 years. There have been plenty of improvements to the state, the NFL, and the Super Bowl since then. But a couple of things haven't changed. We have Sid Hartman here, who was only 71 years old the last time the Super Bowl was played here in Minnesota. And he's here today, still going strong, at the very young age of 97. Sid, we congratulate you on your remarkable career and thank you for all you've done and look forward to your radio show and columns for years to come. The other thing that hasn't changed is the hospitality of this community. And I wanna thank some of the people who are responsible for making our fans, our teams, our partners, and the media feel so comfortable and welcome here in Minneapolis and the Minnesota region. Thank you to the Wilfs and the entire Vikings organization who built with the community a tremendous stadium that we look forward to showing off to the world on Sunday night. We've benefited by the hard work and leadership of three chairs of the Minnesota Super Bowl host committee, Richard Davis, Marilyn Carlson Nelson, and Doug Baker, and the CEO of the host committee, Maureen Bosch. We are deeply grateful to each of you for your leadership and for all you've done for the NFL and this community. And thank you also to Governor Dayton, who was instrumental in getting the stadium built. And a special thanks goes to the thousands of volunteers from around the region who have embraced all of us. Your spirit is contagious. We also thank our fans around the world for their support and passion. We have many of them here in Minnesota this week to culminate and celebrate another remarkable NFL season. The playoffs began with eight teams that missed the postseason last season and ended up with a matchup of the two top playoff seeds. The Eagles are a great example of how quickly things can change in the NFL. They went worst to first in 2017, winning the AFC, NFC East a season after finishing in last place. They represented hope and are a symbol for fans of teams who had a tough year. Anything is possible, and the Eagles are proof of that. Congratulations to Jeffrey Lurie, Don Smolensky, Howie Roseman, Coach Peterson, and to all the Eagles players for an outstanding season. Congratulations also to the Patriots organization, Robert and Jonathan Kraft, Coach Belichick, and their wonderful players. The Patriots are making their 10th Super Bowl appearance and looking for their third championship in just the past four seasons. It's a tremendous accomplishment and a testament to the success of the organization. Thank you all for being here, and I look forward to taking your questions. Roger Barry Wilner from the Associated Press. NFL officiating has come under much scrutiny this season, including a replay that many believe has become too intrusive. Are you satisfied with the current state of officiating, replay, and the rule book? And what changes might you suggest in your role as commissioner? Well, Barry, a couple of things. First. Um, I've been in the league for 36 years, and I think every year I hear the refrain about officiating. And I think it goes with my philosophy, which is I'm never satisfied. Uh, we can always get better. Uh, our officiating can be get better. Uh, so can all of us. And I think our officiating is outstanding. Uh, I believe that with technology the way it is, we see things now that we never saw uh, even 10 years ago. And that makes their job that much harder. But I think they're extraordinary professionals. I would tell you that I think a lot of the focus for us in the offseason is going to be on the rule book. You mentioned that, Barry, and I think it's an important one. Uh, you look at the catch-no-catch the -catch rule. Uh, the officials are officiating that correctly. What we have to do is find a rule that we think is going to address what we think should be a catch in the league. And we had uh, several Hall of Fame players uh, in the NFL office just two weeks ago. We had several coaches, several officials, and we spent three hours and looked through 150 different plays. 
and tried to look for what it is we think should be a catch and then what we think the rules should be to make sure that that is deemed a catch on the field. And I think uh, we have some very good ideas that we're going to submit to the competition committee. I think there'll be a lot of focus on going to the ground, which I think uh, has been part of the confusion for everyone in respect to that rule. And I think we've got a, a great opportunity here to, to get this rule right so that everyone understands it, appreciates it, and uh, that's not the focus going forward. But I think you also mentioned one other thing, Barry, which I'll mention is replay. Uh, we did have more replay interruptions this year. Uh, and I think that's something we've got to look at. Uh, we can improve on. Uh, they were reduced in time. As you know, we spent a great deal of time in the off season on game presentation. How do we make our game uh, more attractive, less stoppages, shorter stoppages when they do occur, whether they're commercial or otherwise? And I think that's one of the things that uh, we're going to focus on. How do we uh, do the replay in a, in a way that will uh, ensure correcting a mistake, an obvious mistake, but uh, make sure that it doesn't interrupt the flow of the game? Roger. Yes. You have two, Sid Hartman, Minneapolis Star Tribune. You have two <laughs> green representatives here. But well, how great would it have been if we had the Vikings in home field <laughs> Super Bowl? Well, I know um, this is a difficult subject for a lot of Vikings fans, and I have one at home, my daughter, and we were fortunate to be here for the Saints game. And I'll, I'll tell you, Sid, um, we sat in the stands with my family, and it was one of the greatest experiences I've had with my family. Uh, the game was spectacular. Uh, sitting with the fans and seeing their emotions uh, rise and fall with the game, uh, having my daughter there to experience it with her, seeing her emotions rise and fall. And to see that kind of a miracle finish, it, it says a lot about NFL football to me. That really talks about what it is. So I think the Vikings had a miracle season. Uh, it's, it's tough to win in this league. They did a great job. And when it, it ends, it's always hard. But I, I think they should take a lot away from the season in a positive way. Um, we're proud of the two teams we have here. They were number one seeds. They deserve to be here. Uh, and. That's how the game is played. Right side. Hey, Roger. Ben Bowen from the Boston Globe. Uh, I'll add up to Flategate question, so I'll let you off the hook there. But I want to that, ask you. That's a shocker, Ben. Yeah, all out. I think four years in a row is enough. I <laughs> uh, want to ask you about Thursday Night Football and this new deal you guys obviously announced today. Uh, players have long complained about the player safety aspect of Thursday Night Football, and the NFL's answer has always been that the injury rate is lower on Sundays or, excuse me, lower on Thursdays than it is the other days of the week, but for the first time ever in 2017, the injury rate was higher on Thursdays. So what's your comment on the injury uh, rate going up on Thursdays, and will any steps be taken to make Thursday Night Football uh, safer going forward? Well, first, uh, Ben, we always work to make the game safer. So we always look to see what we can do. Uh, just to, to be um, respond to the statistical aspect that you raised, uh, out of the last five years where we've kept the sophisticated statistics that we have in injury data, uh, out of those five years, only this year showed a slight uptick, which was not even statistical significant. So uh, if you take it over any period of time during that five years, uh, the injury rate is, uh, is lower. Um, so we do not think that that's something to overreact to. Uh, second, I would tell you that uh, Dee and I have already had some conversations about what it is we could do to address the players uh, for either the time period leading up to the game or the time period following the game. Uh, I think the reaction is clearly mixed uh, within uh, the players that I've spoken to. Uh, obviously, most players don't like a short week, but they sure do love the 10 days that come after that. And in fact, I can remember distinctly several conversations about this, this is like a mini buy, so don't put the Thursday game close to the bye week because that's that's something we want to make sure that we have separated so we can get the, the benefits of both of those. So um, we'll always look to see, are there things that we can improve with our clubs, with our players, to try to make not only Thursday night, but all of our games more safer. How are you, Commissioner? Uh, Luis Alberto Martinez from Televisa Deportes. Hope you had a good time in your last visit to Mexico City. I did. I want to hear from you the confirmation of uh, next year's game in uh, Azteca Stadium, and uh, which are the league expectations for the upcoming years with these Mexico games? 
Well, I did have a wonderful experience uh, in Mexico City. Uh, it's a, the, the event has just grown every year that we've been there. Uh, the enthusiasm for our game continues to grow. The fan base uh, wants more and more football, which uh, is something we look forward to trying to meet that. Uh, we have an exciting game this year with the Rams and the Chiefs. We think that will be something the fans will love. Uh, we don't have the date yet because we're going to put it in our scheduling mix as we do with every other market. Uh, and I think that's something that, uh, from our standpoint, just shows, I think, the sophistication and, and really the passion that the fans have there. Uh, we believe that that game uh, has many more years ahead of it that will allow us to bring great football to our fans in Mexico. Uh, Commissioner Jim Trotter from ESPN. Hey, Jim. This question may be better for the owners, but since they're not on the day, so I'll ask you. When you took office in... I'm sort of used to that, Jim. <laughs> when you took office in 2006, there were seven minority head coaches. Today, there are eight. When you took office, there were four black general managers. Today, there are only three, only two of whom have authority in the decision-making process. When you took office, there were no black club presidents. Today, that number remains the same. My question would be, why is the league having such a hard time promoting and hiring people of color to decision-making positions such as head coach and general manager? Well, Jim, I think uh, not only the Rooney Rule, but the efforts we have to uh, train and give uh, experience to uh, coaches, uh, executives, uh, to advance their careers is something that we put a great deal of focus on and I think has been successful. You see a lot of turnover in this business. You know that better than anybody. Um, and that's something that happens. What we need to do is, is continue the, the work on developing that pipeline, getting the, the right kind of coaches with the right kind of experience that teams want to hire uh, as head coaches. Uh, there's a lot of focus, as an example, uh, the trend now is offensive coaches. We need to work to get more offensive coaches in a position uh, and African-Americans that have uh, offensive coordinator, quarterback coach experience that will see them as the right kind of candidates. They're there. They're great coaches. Uh, we have to make sure we continue to get exposure for them and make sure that they get the opportunities. And that's where the Rooney Rule really works in the sense of making sure that every club is required to not only interview, but also consider seriously candidates uh, with diverse backgrounds uh, and make sure that they're hiring the best people. And I think uh, that served us well, but there's still a lot more work to do outside of the Rooney Rule, including, as you say, developing the pipeline. Hey, Roger, Joe Person with the Charlotte Observer. I have two questions, if I could, uh, related to Jerry Richardson's situation. The Panthers have long had a large base of PSL owners, as you know, and a streak of 160 consecutive sellouts. Will you look to stipulate to the next owner to keep the team in Charlotte? And then as it relates to the investigation, I don't think we've heard from you yet as to who's leading the investigation, the timeline of such, and whether there's safeguards in place for the investigation to continue after the sale of uh, the team. Well, let me address those in reverse order, Joe. Uh, the first one is uh, Mary Jo White, who has uh, uh, got terrific experience, uh, has been hired by us as an independent investigator. Uh, she has begun that process. Uh, she will do her work. Uh, the Panthers have given us full cooperation, given her full cooperation. And when that process is concluded, then uh, we'll report at that point in time. Uh, second, um, the second part was on the PSL holders and staying in Carolina. Uh, any franchise relocation is subject to three quarters vote. Uh, there isn't uh, often a stipulation per se by that. I think uh, all of us and the owners uh, believe that uh, Carolina is a great market. Uh, it's a a market we would like to stay in, and we hope that uh, the franchise uh, owner that's eventually selected will have that view. As you know, that's subject to review by the ownership uh, in the ownership process, and I'm sure that will be a question that many of our owners will ask, and I think that will clearly be the intent of our ownership. <laughs> 